Okay, Hebrews chapter 11. Um, a little bit of background. We're, we're finishing four parts of Hebrews chapter 11. We split it in that, or we've broken it out and broken it out in that way because there's so much history in Hebrews chapter 11 pertaining to uh, Old Testament as that relates to the New Testament and the Hebrews and the other Christians in whom the writer is writing to. And I, I don't mean to be vague on that. We don't know who the author of Hebrews is. Uh, it's a very likely Paul, but, um, you know, we don't really know, so we're not going to get really dug in on that. But there is a message that's being given here, and it's been called by some uh, the Hall of Faith. I've made reference to that each of the three other times that we've uh, been in this particular uh, book. And so this Hall of Faith that we see begins with verse 1, where it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtain a good report. So it gives an overview, so to speak, of, of the things that have been transpiring and that had taken place in the Old Testament. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, here are examples, our elders who walked by faith, heard God and trusted him moving forward. And pretty much in every situation, it comes down to one, they heard God and they believed God. In fact, it even says that in verse six, without faith, it's impossible to please God because you need to come to God knowing that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So it begins with coming to him, but then the other thing that we see having to do with these elders, so to speak, these old guys in the faith going all the way back to, well, I mean, it begins with Abel and moves on forward and includes Abraham and, of course, Noah and um, Moses is who we left off with last time, that we see that they were called by God to do things which are unprecedented, and as anybody else would look at it, absurd. Unprecedented and absurd. But because they knew God and because they had a relationship with him, it didn't really matter if it was crazy or not. Their desire was to just be in that place where they had fellowship with God. And as they had fellowship with God and obeyed God and trusted him, then they were in his presence. They were right where they needed to be. So anything that was weird or unprecedented or, or absurd, at least by the viewpoint of other people, it was okay. An example of that would be Noah, of course. Probably, well, I mean, they're all pretty crazy, but Noah's story is certainly crazy in that here he is. He's, there's never been rain on the earth. There's certainly never been a flood. There's never been a point where the springs would open and, and flood the earth, and yet He's preaching to people about something that he doesn't even really know and understand. He's talking about the fact that there's going to be a flood. And because of the violence and the wickedness in the world, God is bringing a flood. And he's basically <clears throat> preaching, saying anybody there's room on this ark, anybody that wants to come can be saved. But a flood is coming. They've never seen a flood. They've never seen rain. They've, nothing like this has ever occurred before. And yet he believes God because of his word and he's preaching through the building of this ark for anywhere between 50 and 100 years they see this out in the middle of a place where there's no lake or anything along that line there he's just building this thing and people are scoffing they're mocking they're ridiculing and so on but he did it knowing that god was true that he doesn't lie and that what he said would come about. And so he did something that was absurd. He did something that was unprecedented. It was, it's not like anybody had built an ark before, but he obeyed God because he had a relationship with God. So that is an example. We see that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then again, for by it, verse two, the elders obtained a good report. And then in verse three, I'm not going to recount all of this, but in verse three, an important thing for us to note is that Specifically, there's an emphasis here that pretty much everything that was made or everything that's seen was made by Jesus from nothing. 
verse 3. Specifically, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, that he spoke it into existence, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And later on we find in 2 Corinthians that really the only things that are eternal are those things which are not seen. And the things which are seen are temporary. They're not lasting. That it's all going to be, according to the book of Revelation, everything's just going to be consumed, not with a flood, but the heavens and the earth will be consumed in fire. God's rebooting, so to speak. And he's cleansing, he's washing away, or cleansing and, and burning away everything that pertains to that which has fallen. Total destruction, getting rid of it all. So with that, we've you know ventured through from verses 4 through 22. We talked about the patriarchs in Genesis. And then we came to verse 23 through 29, which was about Moses and, and Moses' parents and the Israelites. I mean, there's something else that's not precedented. You're going to go through the middle of the Red Sea on dry ground. And so God did a miracle. And they had to first trust God that he was going to do it, but that midway through that God was going to continue to do it. <laughs> it's not that God was going to say, change his mind or something midway. But thankfully, God doesn't change. He doesn't change his mind in that sense. And so they literally went through on dry ground. It's fascinating because there's actually now some geographic discoveries about this that show that even though the Red Sea where they would have been passing through is as deep as a thousand feet, that there's actually a land bridge or there's there's actually a uh, you know stone bridge in the middle of it that's underwater by about 30 or 40 meters that you don't really see unless you go diving. Then you discover that that's there. And so, okay, it's still a stretch of faith for us to say, well, okay, that the seas parted and became a wall on each side. But Moses was called to do something that was absurd, which was unprecedented, and yet he trusted God to do it. And all the children of Israel trusted God to do it and to walk on through. And whether we can explain these things or not, we know from the foundation that if God's written it, then we need to try to figure out as much as we can. If science can validate, that's great. But really, the most significant thing is it's God's word, and it doesn't change, and it's eternal. He doesn't lie. And so we step out in that, knowing that he's trustworthy. And so we have a whole set of examples that are given in the book of Hebrews, specifically in verse or chapter 11. So we're picking up at verse 30 here, where we're going to talk about the judges and Joshua a little bit, and some of the prophets, and we're going to wrap up the history, so to speak. But the thing that's important for us to remember is that in the very last verse, of this chapter, it says, God having provided some better things for us that they, without us, should not be made perfect. So what is that saying? In other words, we share in this faith together. And these saints of old were looking forward to the promise that was going to come, or that would come, through Jesus Christ at the cross. Just like we are looking back to Jesus Christ at the cross that was a significant point in eternity. Eternity, you have limitless, unending on each side. But right in the middle of it, you have the cross. Where Jesus laid down his life, where he went to the cross, his body was broken, his blood was shed. Why was that? Well, John 3.16, familiar verse, for God so loved the world. Point number one, God loves the world. He loves us, that he sent his son, that whosoever would believe wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. And there's the emphasis right there in that very verse that says that it lays the foundation for us or, or assumes for us the fact that we're sinners and 
God loves us and wants to have fellowship with us, but we have this problem about sin. If you have something that is absolutely pure and perfect, if you have something that's absolutely pure and perfect, then if you introduce any sort of impurity, then you have a problem. The impurity has to go, or that which is perfect is made imperfect. And so, because of God's holiness and righteousness, we can't be in the same place. We can't have fellowship. But God desires to have fellowship with us, and yet, he also desires for us to elect, to choose, to desire that fellowship and to spend that time with him. So he gives us a free will. We have a choice. You have the decision whether you want to follow God or not. All of these, throughout Hebrews chapter 11, had the decision whether they were going to follow or not. Whether they were going to hear God, heed his word, and get on board with it, or if they're just going to say, no, not my thing. It's not going to go there. I'm not interested. And so from this particular point in verse 30, we pick up with the story of Jericho and its walls. Looking at um, Joshua, we read in verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. You'll remember the story. The children of Israel under Moses, his ministry started at 80. This is good news. <laughs> His ministry began at 80 years old. Began at 80 years old. The first 40 years, he was finding how strong he was. The next 40 years, he was discovering how broken he needed to be and how unimportant, insignificant he was. And yet through that, God took him at his old age, at the point of least significance in what he did. He says, Moses, I want you to lead my people out. So he did that. He kind of wrestled with God a little bit. He sort of argued some, but he ended up doing it. And he lived 120 years total. So he had a 40-year ministry leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And most of that time, arguably, you could say probably 37 years of it, were spent with the Israelites going around in circles because of their unbelief and their hard-heartedness and you know their un just their attitude saying yes even though God brought all those plagues even though there was the miracle of Passover that there was the opportunity to pass through the Red Sea that they went up against the Amorites and won a battle after they've been traveling all this time that even with all of the examples of how God had worked that they didn't believe and it's a sad situation. But they come to that, and Moses gets angry because they're complaining all the time, just complaining all the time. Maybe you know someone that complains all the time. Maybe you're sitting next to someone who complains all the time. And as a result of that complaint, he got angry with the people. They were thirsty. And where normally he would go to the rock where he was told before and strike the rock one time and then water came forth, he went up to the rock and smashed it a couple times in his anger. And so as a result of that, God said, okay, water can come forth and it can feed or you know, water three million people. And that area actually in Arabia has the capacity to do that. There's, there's a low area where this, all this water could have cooled and, and literally watered two to three million people. But he hit the rock, he smote the rock when in his anger he shouldn't have. And then as a result, God said, well, you're misrepresenting me. I'm not angry with my people. You shouldn't be. Why are you angry with my people when I'm not angry with people? If anyone should be angry with people... It, should be me, but I'm not. I love them. And so God didn't allow Moses to enter into the promised land. And so they wandered in that unbelief, in that whole generation that had experienced 
the Red Sea and the departure from Egypt, they all died. It was their kids who ended up coming into the promised land under a new leader, Joshua. Joshua. Which means the Lord shall save, Yeshua. Joshua. Same name as Jesus, even though we call him Jesus. It's the same name. And so we see Joshua on the other side of the uh, Jordan River. And they're coming on in. And the Lord is saying, Joshua, this is what I want you to do in chapter 1. He appears to him. And Joshua goes up to this guy. He sees this guy there with an angel. I'm sorry, with a sword drawn. And it's an, the angel of the Lord. And Joshua says, are you for us or against us? And basically the angel of the Lord says, I'm the angel of the Lord. And then Joshua says, whoa, I better. And he realizes that it's not so much a matter of whether he's on our side. It's a matter of whether I'm going to get on his side. So that's chapter one of Joshua. But then the Lord goes on and tells him, this is what I want you to do. I want you to spend, send scouts or spies is what it reads in the King James, New King James. But they're, they're scouts. They're going on in, two of them. They're going to go into that area, and specifically, if they can, they're going to go into Jericho, which is just on the other side of the Jordan. They're going to go into the first city there and see what's going on, sort of get some idea tactically what they need to do. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that God doesn't really need that sort of reconnaissance to take place. He called them to do that so that they would go in, and what this all comes around to is that they would save this one particular woman and her family. Her name is Rahab. She's a harlot. And yet, God is going to use her to be the lineage, the great-grandmother, sorry, great-grandmother, grandmother, great-grandmother great of King David, who, of course, we know through his line comes the Messiah. So God's doing something here. From their standpoint, it's reconnaissance. From God's standpoint, in hindsight, we're looking at it, we're seeing, oh, no, God's got another plan. He wants to save a person in there. He wants to do a work. Out of all the people in Jericho, he wants to do a work in this one woman who sort of compromised her life and is now, with the conviction of God upon her heart, wants to change. So we'll get to that in the next verse. But in verse 30 specifically, they sent in the two, the two spies, the two scouts into Jericho. And when they got in there, they, they hid in the house of Rahab. And so people, the spies, they said, hey, you know, there's, there's these two guys that are in here. And it looks like they're scouting this around. And I think they're the Hebrews. Well, we find out from Rahab that they knew who the, the Israelites were. And they were nervous. It was 40 years ago that God did all these things there back in Egypt from the Red Sea. But preceding that, all of the plagues that came down, the you know departure that they made, that exodus, they've been worried about this for 40 years. Do you have any problems that have been with you for 40 years? They can be resolved sooner than that. But <laughs> that's what they were dealing with. For 40 years, they're anxious about this. And so what ends up happening? Well... The king says, I want you to get those guys. So they go to Rahab's house. And then Rahab says, well, you know what? I don't really, they're, they're not here right now. You can see, well, what she had done is she hid, her, hid them up on the roof and she covered them with thatch. So she could say, honestly, they're not here. And yet they were right above. So she says, but you should go out and try to get them as fast as you can. So they sent the people out and they're out looking. And then they can't find them, so they end up coming back in, close the gates. And then as you know the story, she ended up letting them go, releasing them. And then they, they get out over the wall, and then they go back to where the camp is with Joshua. But she says something very specific that relates to her own family having believed God and what he did. But let's, before we get to that, let's talk about the wall. Because specifically, what God told Joshua to do and the Israelites to do was crazy. He said, this is what I want you to do. I know it's never been done before. He doesn't preface it that way, but I'm sure they're thinking, what's up with this? But nevertheless, they're coming close to God. 
Joshua is, and God says, I want you to go around the city, march with all the people, with the priests. I want you to be totally quiet. Not a sound, except for the priests. And the priests are going to have a shofar or a trumpet, a, a ram's horn. There's seven priests, and they're going to be blowing this thing the whole time. All the time, you've got a huge assembly of people. You've got armed people, but really you've got the two or three million or whoever it was that was left going around the city walls of Jericho. I want you to do that once a day for six days. So they go and they circle. Everybody is quiet. They're carrying the Ark of the Covenant with them. They have a rear guard and they have a forward guard and you have all these people, all the inhabitants, and they're marching around Jericho, not saying a word. But the priests who are with the ark are blowing this, these trumpets. Day one goes by. I'm sure the people in Jericho are thinking, what's up with this? Day two comes, they do the same thing. Third day, same thing. And then on the seventh day, they rise up early in the morning and same instructions, but now they're going to circle the city seven times. Familiar? You know the story. Circle it seven times. And then when they heard the word of Joshua, that all of this quiet would be happening. But when they heard the word of Joshua, what would they do? They would shout. They would shout. And God told them that the walls are going to fall down flat. Okay, well, what's up with that? Really? Is that really going to happen? Can that really happen? Is that, is that physically able to take place? I mean, is that scientifically able to occur? And yet God said, this is what I want you to do. And so they did it. And so they circle seven times, and then they shout, and then the walls fell down flat in toward the city. And if you go to Jericho today, there's still the archaeological evidence of the walls having fallen forward. Which is crazy, because if you've got something that's square or rectangular or rounded, if they don't go in well. It's going to fall out, perhaps, because it's weak on the corners, but here they fell inward at their shout. And of course they went in and took the city at that point except for a particular woman by the name of Rahab. So they were having to step up and do something that God called them to do. They didn't know what really the outcome was. I mean, they were told what the outcome was, but they had to just trust God by faith in it. Carl and I were having a discussion about this driving in, not about this particular topic, but it's the idea of faith that, you know, you don't necessarily know what the good things are that are going to happen. You know that all things work together for good to those that are the called according to his purposes, right? Okay, we understand that. And so if we're his, we're the called, then good things can happen. But we don't always see those good things happen in the sense of our timeline. There may be bad things that happen, but we know good will come out of it. But see, the issue is it's not really whether we reap the reward now. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Chapter 11, verse 6, right? But the thing that's unique there is that when you're right in the presence or in the obedience to what God wants you to do, that's a good place. It's the perfect place. It's exactly, this is where martyrs have been able to stand under the excruciating pressure. It's what we see later on with Jesus in the next chapter where it tells about talks about how it was a joy that was set before him, that he endured the cross and despised the shame. He was right in the middle of what the Father wanted him to do while he's being beaten and crucified. That doesn't seem like fun. It doesn't seem like good. But he was exactly where God the Father wanted him to be, and so as a result, it was a joy for him to be there. And so as a result, 
it turned out for good because as a result of him going to the cross, he redeemed. I mean, if he just came down off the cross like they were shouting and mocking, oh, if you're really the son of God, then come down off the cross. Call your angels to help you. He could have. He absolutely could have. But he didn't. Because it was better, it was gooder for him to remain on the cross in the very place of God's joy being poured out upon him, even though he's suffering and being crucified because God loves the world. And this is the way that he's going to redeem the world once and for all, that there would be one sacrifice, his son, who was human, just like the bunch of sinners, but without sin, but God in the sense that he's comprehensive and could redeem all who would come to him and take care of sin once and for all by his death. So what we see going on with Jericho is amazing. They're marching around. They just know, I don't really get this marching thing. I don't know why we need to be quiet, but I know this is exactly where I need to be right now. And there are places where each one of us need to be through the week, or we can have situations that come up that seem like a setback, but it's exactly where we're supposed to be. It's like, I'm trying to get to church, I'm trying to get to work, and yet somehow I've lost my keys, or I can't find my glasses, or whatever it is. And even though it seems like a setback, if we just rest in who the Lord is and what he wants to do, we may discover that there's a reason for that delay. There's a purpose in what he's doing. Or we may not find out for 2,000 years what the story is. But nevertheless, we know that where we need to be is just resting in who the Lord is, which is what chapter four is all about, entering into his rest, not striving, not worrying, not anxious, not overwhelmed, but just resting. That, that doesn't imply that we're not supposed to work. We understand that we hear God's word and we work, we take a step forward. The children of Israel still needed to march around Jericho. They still needed to do this on the seventh day to shout, when told, and then as a result, the walls would come in. But they just needed to be exactly where God wanted them to be. Sometimes you know where that is because he's spoken to you, you understand it through scripture. Other times, <coughs> it may not seem very apparent, but if you have a setback, to be willing to say, okay, I'm not going to let this setback stress me out even more and blind me with my anger, but to seek God and try to figure out, you know, what he's wanting to do. So by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. So they went around it seven days on the seventh day, seven times, and then they shouted and the walls fell flat. And then in verse 31, also in Jericho, by faith, the Part that Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. So out of all of the people that believed in Jericho, who comes out of it? A harlot. We've got other names for that. Now that I've even said that, you may even be thinking about some of those names. But it was a harlot. What this is telling us is that out of all of the people, now she, because of her activities and what she did, by faith, trusting God, she ended up saving her father and her mother and her brothers and her sisters. But she made a decision. And it wasn't because of her social status that belief worked. It wasn't because of her ethnicity. She was a Gentile. She wasn't a Jew. Had nothing to do with that. It was because she heard God, just like all the other people did, but she opted to believe it, as opposed to all the other people that didn't. So just think about that for a minute. It's just like, wait a second, we're all hearing the same message. 
You have the same Bible I have. We're reading the same things. We celebrate Christmas together. We have the stories about Christmas, and hopefully it's not just about Santa Claus, but we have the we understand what it is about Jesus. We we celebrate Easter or Resurrection Sunday after Passover. People in this world have heard these messages. All around the world, we know that there's been a flood. There's archaeological evidence for all sorts of things that we see through the Bible that, that's, that's given to us. We see evidence of, of creation everywhere. We see evidence of a creator all around us. Yet what is it that some people say, I'm going to believe that, and other people say, I'm not? Is it because they're rich? Is it because they're you know, religious? They have some pedigree? We don't really know. We just know that some people say yes to the things of God, even when it may be absurd or unprecedented or go against family or nation or people you work with, whatever it is, peer groups, you have to make a choice about this thing which is true, about Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. I mean, we have to make a decision about that. Everybody does. And why some receive that and some don't, we can't understand it. But it's our job to continue to at least teach it, share it. We could say preach it. But so by faith, Rahab the heart of perished not with them that believed. Them that believed not. They were equal here for an opportunity to believe, but they didn't buy it. So what did Rahab say to the men? She said, I know that the Lord has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. So she's talking about everyone in Jericho. We are all in the same boat. And she's saying, I, I know this, but they know it too. So we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. This is all from Joshua 2, and we're getting into verse 11. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted, neither did there remain any more courage, <coughs> excuse me, in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven, above and on earth beneath. Rahab's recognizing the same thing. What happened when her heart fainted and she realized, oh my gosh, the Lord is, you know, God is real. He's, he's God. And now his people are coming through here and they're ready to wipe things out and what are we going to do? Everybody else is, this is where you understand that we're done for. Okay, we're, this is where you understand I'm a sinner. It's not working out so good. It's bad news for me unless I do something about it. And so she sees an opportunity right before her. She knows that she, along with everybody else in Jericho, are going to be wiped out. So what does she do? She makes a request that they save her and her father and mother and brothers and sisters. This Gentile, she makes this request of Jews. Out of all the people in Jericho, she makes this request. And again, this is the whole thing. We can all be hearers of God's word, but it comes down to who's going to say, I've got to make a decision. I know that's true. So even if nobody else goes, I'm still in. Okay, you know the song, I have decided to follow Jesus, decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. We all come to the same place where we see, boy, we're accountable. We, we can't escape this, and we're doomed unless some miracle happens where I can be saved. And this is what's happening. Rahab is seeing, I've got a miracle before me. So when you guys come through, be sure to save me. And again, this is all part of the bigger picture because she's the great-grandmother of King David. All right, so we're going to pick up the pace. What's it been? A little while for two verses. So we're, we're going to go a little quicker now. Verse 32, and what more shall I say? The writer of Hebrews is, is saying, there's so many examples, but what more can I say? Then he just throws these names out here for them to know or be reminded of. They would know this, and we should too. But if we don't, then we can study it. But they would know this, 
He says, For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and of the prophets. Okay, some of those names you may know. Some of you may be good Bible students and you may know who all of those guys are. That's good. But if you don't know, then study it. Don't just say, well, I don't know, so I'll never know. I will never, ever know because I don't know this now. No, you can study it. You can read it. It's all there. A lot of times we don't even want to read it because we know we'll be convicted. So it's just like, I don't want to read that because I'll, you know, be convicted. And I don't want to be convicted because I don't want to be, have to be accountable to the truth that's been set before me. Right? That's what it all comes down to. I don't want to hear any of it because, you know, just it's the ostrich in uh, his head in the sand. But I want to hear it. But he gives these examples. So he talks about Gideon first, and then Barak and Samson, and, you know, numerous examples. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So numerous people who have heard God speak to them, and they said, I'm going forward. What else can I do? God's telling me to do this. What else can I do? God's calling, tugging on your heart, saying, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Well, I want to come to the Father. And if it's only by him, then I guess i got to make a decision here. And so all of these came to that point. Gideon, you remember the story. The Midianites were after him, after the children of Israel. So he takes, he, he says, okay, anyone who wants to fight, come on out. And then they got a bunch of these people to fight. Thousands of people to fight. And then there was this vetting process. First of all, he said, if you don't really want to fight, if you're just out here because you thought you wanted to fight, but you don't really want to fight, then you can go home. Most of them went home. And then he had a couple thousand left. And so the Lord told him to take them down to a stream and have them get something to drink. And some of them stuck their head in the water and drank like a bunch of dogs and others you know, were on their knee and, and drank, you know, grabbed some water and, and cupped it and put it in, in their mouth that way. He says, choose those guys. And what it came down to was 300 guys. 300 guys against thousands of Midianites. Midian is on the other side of the Red Sea. It's where it's uh, western Saudi Arabia now. So they're going to battle. 300 guys. And so God tells um, Gideon, who was reluctant at first. You, you remember the story there. He said, well, God, if, if you're in this, then, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place a fleece out there. You know the story. If, if I place a fleece out there and it's wet, but the ground is dry, I'll know you're in it. So the next day he goes out there and the ground's all dry, but the fleece is wet. So the the, the, the whatever, the, the lamb skin is wet. So he says, okay, just so I'm not getting anything wrong, then tomorrow I want the fleece dry. If you're really in this, I want the fleece dry and all the rest of the ground wet around it. And so the Lord did that. One person actually said, so he swam out to the fleece and got it. <laughs> the point is, is that it was dry. God's trying to tell him, Gideon, you're my man. Gideon's saying, I'm not your man. I'm not even a, you know, I'm not some warrior, but he's saying, you're my man. And so he took these 300 people, divided them into three. So 100 people each. And what did they do? They had these shofars and they had these clay pots. A trumpet and a clay pot. And it was at night. And they took these clay pots and they put them over their um, torches. And they're all surrounding the Midianites, right? This is all God's tactic here. They're surrounding the Midianites. And then at a specific time, what happens? Gideon cries out. They take the pots. They smash the pots all in unison. And then they shout and they blow their trumpets. 300 of them. And the Midianites... They're scared to death because all of a sudden there's all of this commotion all around them and all these fires, 300 of them. And they think, well, with every fire, there must be at least 100 people. And so the Midianites end up killing each other. And they're, you know, it's dark, so they pull out their swords and just start hacking away. And so Gideon doesn't have to do anything. They kill each other. They kill themselves in the process, thinking that they're defending themselves. 
Gideon is the warrior there. And yet, even with very few, he won. Why is that? Because God was doing the work. He was showing that he's strong through that situation. Then you have Barak, who also from the book of Judges, uh, he's unwilling. In fact, he's so unwilling that there's a judge by the name of Deborah who says, look, we need to go to war. I'm not really your war person. I'm your judge here, but we need some guys. There's no guys that are stepping up. Literally, no guys that are stepping up to do the work. So God raised up a woman, Deborah. And she goes to Barak and she says, we need to fight. There's a war set before us. So what does Barak do? He says, well, if you'll go with me, Deborah, then I'll go. But if you will not go with me, I, I won't go. So she says, okay, then I'll, I'll go with you. But we need a general here. And so she enlists him. And Barak ends up being the one who gets the glory here. But they're oppressed here by the Canaanites. And they've got that general Sisera. And you remember the story there, the tent peg? Remember with, anyway, we need to visit that. But that's in Judges. Chapter 7. I'm sorry, chapter 4. Gideon was chapter 7. Then we have Samson. Basically a failure his whole life. Right? A failure his whole life. But then at the end, when he's totally broken, he poked out his eyes, remember his girlfriend, Delilah. So, dainty. So they poke out his eyes, the Philistines do, and they've, they've now taken this man who could, who could just tear things up. He's now in a weakened state. His hair's cut. He's, he's blinded. But then he takes out the entire Philistine temple by getting between the pillars and pushing them with his strength. Somehow there's a tie-in between his hair and his strength. What? I don't, why? I don't know. Is there some sort of scientific thing there? It's just how it is. But God's glory was with him in that situation. So he brought down this this temple upon 3,000 Philistines, trusted by faith. Jephthah, son of a harlot, mighty person, fought battles. Who else do we have? Of course, we have David spoken of. Went up against Goliath. The King Saul was chasing him. But, he, you know, when we think about King David, what do we think about? Usually it's, it might be Goliath going up against this giant, nine foot tall guy. David, the youngest of the, of all of the brothers, and he's going up against this giant. He's saying, who is this uncircumcised Philistine calling out the Israelites, calling them cowards? Let me at him, let me at him. You can just hear it. And so what's he do? He grabs five smooth stones, a sling, and starts running out after him, and Goliath's just saying, what's this? You brought, you know, my dog that you bring, you know, and he's coming out, and then he slings the sling, Hits him in the middle of the, you know, in the forehead, and he falls down. But those of you who are interested in studying, and especially the young guys, we really liked that it wasn't the stone that killed him. What was it? He got Goliath's sword, which was huge and heavy, and lopped off his head with it. So that's kind of exciting. Us guys, we like that sort of stuff. We we live for that sort of movie and action and so on. And then we come to Samuel. And I'll just speak to, to his story. In Psalm 99, it says, Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called upon the name. They called upon the name of the Lord, and he answered them by faith. By faith. Verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, so speaking of David, wrought the righteousness, in other words, uh, administered justice, that would be Samuel, and obtained promises. Again, talking about David, stopped the mouths of lions. Well, that's Daniel, right? In the lion's den. Daniel chapter 6, quench the violence of fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their situation wasn't fun, was it? They have to go into this fiery furnace. They're thinking, man, this is a bummer. But they're going in there, and what ends up happening? The Lord is with them. Nebuchadnezzar says, aren't there, didn't I send three guys in there? Why is there four? And why aren't they getting burnt? Why is it the guy that threw them in there was burnt, just being close to it? But why aren't they being burnt? And why is... What's, what's with this other guy? He looks like the son of God. And so, quench the violence of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. That's pretty much David, all of these uh, following in verse 34. Out of weakness, <clears throat> specifically, 
out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant, and fight turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. That happened through both Elijah and Elisha. So uh, people raised from the dead. Well, I don't really believe that that can happen. Well, it happened. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. So all of these other things preceding it seem like, okay, they went to battle and they won. And they you know, sought God and they found him and he spoke. But then it goes, and others. Then it says, we're tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better salvation. Good doesn't always follow faith in the sense of good outcomes, but the good is like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where the Lord was with them, right? That's what it comes down to. The Lord was with them. So moving on, it says, and this is where we come into what some of the crazy things that happened to them were, verse 36, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, the bonds and imprisonment. This is Jeremiah. They were stoned. That's Zechariah, 2 Chronicles, chapter 24. These are prophets of God that were, they were killed because, well, you know, you're, you're making me feel bad because I'm, you're sharing something. You're sharing the truth of what God's word is, and I don't want to hear that right now, so I'm going to go after you and punish you because I'm in a position to do it. And that's what they were doing. They would, they would kill these guys, stone them. They were sawn asunder. The tradition there is Isaiah, that he was sawn in half. Okay, Isaiah is an awesome, awesome prophet. You read through the book of Isaiah, it's, it's wonderful. But to find out, here's a guy that in the end, he was sawn in half. I mean, just think about it for a minute. What's, how in half would you want to be sawn? You know, bottom to top, top to bottom, left to right, right to left. He was sawn in half. This is what happened. This is how cruel they were. And if you look through some of the more modern um, martyrdoms, you see that when people are convicted, but they don't want to hear God's word and they say no, that they get mean, very mean, very ugly. And yet the question is, is they're in the hall of faith. They have trust that they're exactly where God wants them to be at that time. They wouldn't want to be anywhere else. We could say, wouldn't you rather not be sawn in half? I would tend to say yes. But if that's exactly where God wants them to be, because he's doing work not only in them as they perish, but then also among everybody else that's a witness to it, then it's exactly what God wants, and we submit to it. And there's a, there's a glory there. There's a, there's a peace there. There's a rest there. Many people are afraid of death just in general because they don't believe that there's life afterward. Well, the good news is that there is life afterward. The bad news is that there, everyone is eternal, though. So if you're not in Christ, then there's eternity and separation from him. But it's not like we are just annihilated. We have two directions. We can either go into glory or we can go into everlasting consequence punishment as a result so isaiah and they were tempted they were slain with the sword they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins elijah um being destitute afflicted tormented some people think elijah just went around in that stuff just to kind of prove a point like you know your rock stars they you know, got all the chains and it's because it's part of the look it wasn't that it's just he was poor and all he had was you know, camel hair coverings. That's what he had. That was it. He ate locusts because he didn't have steak. He didn't have lamb chops. He didn't have other things to eat. This is what God gave to him. That's what God provided for him. So that's what he ate. And wild honey. And then, lastly, um, being destitute, of whom the world was not worthy, it says. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in caves and in caves of the earth, in dens and in caves of the earth. Verse 39, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So what is this saying? They didn't receive the promise? No, they did not yet. 
the promise was ahead. It was, it was Christ. The, the knowledge that the Savior was one day going to come. It was just a promise to them. See, it, it hadn't occurred yet. It didn't have the benefit of that having taken place. We, on the other hand, do have the benefit of that. As mentioned, right there smack in the middle of eternity, you have the cross and the resurrection. So where are we on it? We can look back on it and say, eh, nice story. They could have looked forward. Rahab's companions, all the other scoundrels there in Jericho, could have just said, eh, don't think there's going to be anything bad going on. I'll make it. I'm tough. I'm a prepper. I've got guns. I've got food. I've got stuff. And then the walls fall in. And then you're thinking, man, I thought I had it all together. And the walls fell in on me. And so it's the same thing here. They, Those who had faith trusted forward to the cross what Jesus was going to do. We have the benefit of having known what Jesus did. And so not only has that occurred, but now he comes and there's a spiritual work. We're called born again because there's a spiritual work that's taken place in our hearts, in our, in our lives. We have new life. We're saved. We have security. We have peace. All of these things may still and can still happen to us that happened to these other guys before, but they were given to us to show us that the best place to be is exactly where God wants you. And so the question now is, are you exactly where God wants you to be? With regard to not just proximity right now, but with your life, with eternity, where are you at on all of those questions? Where are you at with respect to the horizon? Is that horizon something that you're forging or are you trusting God for? Do you understand that there's an eternal life or is it just like, don't buy it? Well, at least make an educated decision. Because a lot of times it's not even done. It's not even pursued. So it's a matter of coming to the truth and saying, okay, asking Jesus, if you are the way, the truth, and the life, then show me your way. Show me that it's true and show me how to live because that's what I'm interested in. But it's an honest question and it really comes down to just being honest with him and honest with yourself to say what does this all mean to me or am I just coasting through life waiting for the walls to fall in not even realizing it so Lord thank you for Hebrews chapter 11